Good morning, Messiah. Stand up and let's sing together.
thanks that you've gathered us again in this space. May your spirit be made known, and may we grow closer to you by this investment of love this morning. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take time to share God's love and God's peace with one another now. A couple. Come on down. You got summer coming down there. Just some girls, huh? Look at that. Oh, goodness. Did you girls know that I, where are you? Oh, you're behind me. <laughs> Did you know that I played piano? Huh? Yep, I took piano lessons for six years. And I, and I used to, you know, I stopped when I was like in ninth grade or something like that. Do you know, are you guys in ninth grade? No. Well, I was probably in third grade when I started. What are you, second grade summer? Second grade? How old are you? Huh? Nine years? So you're what, then third grade or fourth grade? fourth yeah so I was already playing by fourth grade and I really liked to play and the more I practiced the better I got right you've heard that before right the more I practiced the better I mean the more I practiced the better I got <sighs> around eighth grade my teacher said I wasn't practicing very much and I wasn't getting any better and she was starting to feel bad about taking my parents money so she told me to quit and now, do you know what? I can't play piano because that was a long time ago. And, and if I tried to sit down and play the music like Tyler does on there, oh my goodness, I wouldn't even come close to something like that. If I just tried to pound out something, because we got to practice to get good at stuff, don't we? Do you, boys, do you boys and girls practice at anything to get good? Is there anything you practice at that you've gotten better at? What's that? What's that? Put, put on your mask so I can hear you. Piano. Oh, you do piano? Oh, my goodness. Well, there you go. Math. math? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my wife would love that. She's a math teacher. Basketball. Basketball, right? The more you practice, the better you get. And if I ask these people out behind me, they all have something that they practice. Our band practices to get ready for today. And, you know, we even practice love. The more we love, the better we get at loving. The more we work at loving, the better we get. The more we work at loving God, hi Gabe, the better we get at loving God. Love works a lot like that. And if we stop paying attention to being loving, we're just not very loving in the world. Just as I stopped paying attention to the piano, and now I can't play at all. So how do you think the ways are that we, that we get good at loving God? 
Uh, we come to church. We learn God's story in Sunday school. We, we serve and find ways to love our neighbor through the things that the church does and through our community. Huh. We make time for God. Maybe that's the most important thing because that's what I wasn't doing when I was doing piano. I wasn't making time. Are you good at making time for piano? I bet you are. Let's say a prayer. Lord, help us to be loving by helping us make loving you our priority. Amen. All right. Thank you. I think I saw Angela coming with stuff and Laura. Follow out Angela and Laura, okay? Thanks for coming forward. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Even at this stage in life. <laughs> uh, we're doing... Reading? Reading, yeah. right. You guys look ready, but we got a scripture before you're ready, mm -hmm. right? Do I have anybody reading scripture? Or am I, is it me? Okay. No. Oh, there you go. My New Year's resolution was to read that. It's not up there? <laughs> I think I think you got it. I can read it, Carol. You don't. You, you didn't know you were supposed to read, it anyways. So my New Year's resolution was to was not to have to go through this on a Sunday to look at this thing and, and know when it was coming up. And obviously, I failed already. Here we go. Oh, it's right on Psalm forty nine. That's why. <laughs> uh, you ready? Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. And I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of my harp. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give God for this. For the ransom of life is costly and can never su suffice that one should live on forever and never see the grave. When we look at the wise, they die. <laughs> Fool and dolt perish together and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they named lands their own. Mortals cannot abide in their pomp, and they are like animals that perish. Such is the faith of the foolhardy, the end of those who are pleased with their lot. Like sheep, they are appointed for shale. Death shall be their shepherd straight to the grave they descend. And their form shall waste away. Sheol will be their home. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Do not be afraid when some become rich, when the wealth of their houses increase. For when they die, they will carry nothing away. Their wealth will not go down after them. Though in their lifetime they count themselves happy. For you are praised when you do well for yourself. They will go to the company of their ancestors, who will never again see the light. Mortals cannot abide in their pomp. They are like animals that must perish. The word of the Lord. Let's please stand as we sing our gospel.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. So someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Rabbi, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And then he said, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then Jesus told this parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, well, what should I do? For I have no place to store all these crops. And then he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and I'm going to build larger barns. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to myself, self, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you are prepared, whose will they be then? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So my life is uh, full of boxes right now. Uh, that's a picture of my corner of my basement where we're making a small or short move around the corner uh, from our house where we live now and a slow, slow, short move as this house is being prepared for us. And so I've spent the last year deciding what stuff is worthy of being taken on this move and what stuff I can just throw away and and I'm amazed that even though I count myself as not a sentimental guy, uh, all the stuff that I still think I need to hold on to and keep, and so, where to go? So it keeps building up in that basement there, uh, uh, building out. And then that other picture is an empty room of all these empty boxes <laughs> in my house that, that are waiting to have more precious stuff that's in corners and cabinets and closets as I prepare for this move. Just amazed at how much I can accumulate. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld had a riff in his uh, stand-up about boxes and about how we spend all of our lives looking for the right box and looking for boxes to, to hold our stuff and looking for boxes when we move. And uh, as part of that, he, he says that even when he goes to funerals, he, he gets distracted by the boxes that he he sits there and he should be grieving over his friend and instead he, he leans over to the guy next to him and says, can you check out that box, huh? Where do you think he got that? Do you think he could give it to me when he's done? I mean, look at those handles. A guy could use a box like that. <laughs> and he says at the end of it that, that he thinks of moving as kind of a, uh, that, final, uh, that final container box story that, that you've been looking for, that the, that the hearse is the moving van and the, and the friends that you guilt into moving for you are the pallbearers and, the, uh, and that box is the best box you've ever bought, at least the most expensive box you've ever bought. Boxes. That, uh, that riff I read in Ortberg's uh, book that we're, working on on Wednesday nights. When the game is over, it all goes back in the box. Uh, it's, it's this idea that, that life uh, can be thought of as, as kind of a game. And if we think of it like that, then we've got to decide what we're playing the game for. What, 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 what does winning look like? And if you think back on your life, you can think back on all the different times of your life and where you were and who you were and, and what you needed and what your insecurities might have been. And those were like the things you were playing for. So at 16, I, I was playing the game of life for girls. That was the only thing on my mind. And, uh, and when I was in college, I was playing it for grades. When I was in my 20s and working at Roadway Express, I was playing it for promotions and status and money and by the time I got into my 30s, my kids were so distracting and demanding that I was playing just for their survival, <laughs> that I didn't hurt them. And by the time I got to 40s, 
I was here with you, and, uh, <clears throat> and I was playing the game of life, honestly, for vanity and recognition in my 40s. To, to be known as that pastor, I think, is, was important to me. I'm shamefaced to say. And now in my 50s, I had trouble coming up with something, and, and I ended up just with the word relevance in my notes that I made. Just relevance. That what we play for, as I was looking back at my list, they're often our deepest insecurities. <laughs> Those become our largest priorities. You know, girls, success, relevance. What worries us most sometimes becomes what our biggest priority in the midst of our lives. And Orberg suggests that we, that we notice these things that we worry the most about. And he uses this story that I, <clears throat> from Jesus, the parable that I read, to start that conversation. Very familiar parable. You, you've heard this one before, I'm sure, uh, about a farmer because of good luck and, and, and good farming techniques and, and, and good investment in the right seed somehow ended up with more crops than he's ever gotten before. And the problem for that abundance is he's only got a small barn. So he comes up with the better idea of building a bigger barn. And, and once he builds a bigger barn, then he's going to take some time to eat, drink, and be merry. And then, of course, you, you heard what happens uh, when the bigger barn is done. He, he dies that day, and, and he leaves behind this bigger barn full of stuff. And he never has a chance for that eating and drinking and merrymaking. And when he gets to heaven, God calls him a fool. Can you imagine that? Living your life, living a successful life. And God calls you a fool. And God calls him a fool because who he'd been talking to all that time was his self. If he'd been talking to God, God might have suggested, you know, that little barn you got has more than enough stuff in it. You could surely stop stacking that away and give that abundance to people who might need it. God calls him a fool because he wasted precious time on this earth building a bigger barn <laughs> rather than the other activities that God hoped for. Eating, <laughs> drinking, and being merry, maybe. But certainly, sharing an abundance that he's already received. Wasted it. His insecurities of whether he's going to have enough overwhelmed him. And God called him a fool. And in the story, Jesus, after he tells the parable... <clears throat> He tells us what the parable means. He says he's a fool because he hasn't been rich towards God. Rich towards God. He's been rich towards himself. Possibly rich towards his neighbors or his, or his family at least. But he hasn't been rich towards God. What do you think rich towards God means? I don't think it's that tough. Orberg suggests that it just simply means living a life that makes God smile. <laughs> that at the end of it, God isn't calling us a fool. Living a life that brings joy to God by the joy we spread in the world. Living a life that is more concerned about the joy around us than the securities. We're tamping down with our bigger barns. Being rich towards God makes God smile. And so at that point, it starts becoming a story about love. Because what we learn in Scripture, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, that the way we make God smile is by loving God and loving neighbor. And like I said in my children's sermon, loving God is isn't something that we can just move from a head thing to a heart thing. Everyone in this room who's come out on a 17-degree day knows that they are called to love God. Everyone that's listening at home in a, probably a much warmer room than we're in right now 
knows that they're supposed to love God, but how do you move that head thing into a heart thing? You know, it's all about investment, isn't it? It's all about investment. The, the, the paradigm that I always think about was that in the first eight years of our marriage, we uh, made all these kids, and Paige was a stay-at-home mom while I worked. And the more kids we had, because they multiplied like bunnies in our house, the more, the more kids we had, it seems like the more I worked. And I, I'm guessing that the two had something to do with each other, because I know that when my kids were small, because Paige took care of them primarily, I wasn't alone with them that often. In fact, when I was alone with them, I used to say I was babysitting my kids, which was not a popular thing to come out of my mouth. So that I would actually get anxious when Paige would leave the few times and I'd have to watch them. And it was because I wasn't that familiar with them. You know, I, I didn't know how to make the four-year-old stop crying. I, I, I didn't know exactly what they did eat because I never had to make their meals. And then when my twins, the youngest, when they were four, I started going to seminary and Paige worked and supported the family while I went to school. And then I was the full-time stay-at-home parent at that point. <clears throat> and that really made me anxious at first. But what I found was the more I was around them, not only the better I got at fixing their meals and, and, and keeping them from hurting each other and keeping them from hurting themselves, the better I got just simply at loving them, at delighting in their gifts, at, 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 at seeing their, their weaknesses that, that made them human and beautiful too. You know, that, that this head thing that of course I loved my children, Moved from a head thing to a heart thing by simply spending more time with them. And I think that's the way all love works. The more intentional time, grace-filled time that we spend, the more likely we are to maintain a loving relationship. I think that's true for God. And the way we spend times with God, our, our, our gathering for worship, our including God in our prayers, our, our growing our faith, and studying, and, and our serving in God's world. And the more time we spend with God, the easier it is for this head thing of God's love to move to our heart thing. I don't think you need to go to church in order to go to heaven. I do think it's really hard to love God if you're not intentional in that relationship. And church helps you be intentional in that relationship. And once God is our top priority, then, then we move to those, to those other things, right? To, to loving God's world, to loving what God loves, to loving our neighbor, loving creation. <laughs> and the first step hopefully is the easiest step, is, is loving those that are closest to you, you know, your family and friends and the people you like. And, and there's no shame in that, right? In Ethiopia, Orpurg writes that uh, people's wealth is evaluated by how many friends they have. That's how they determine how much wealth you have. And, and, and you know, and the standard way for us to calculate wealth is by how much investments you have, right? I mean, by how much, you know, how much are you worth sort of thing. But your value or worth in Ethiopia, according to Orpurg, is more determined by how many friends you've gathered in the midst of your life. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because friends are an investment of time and priority just as much as your banking is an investment of time and priority. In fact, friends are a piece of luck, too. Just like some of us who have gotten rich in this world is a piece of luck of who we, where we've been born and what opportunities we've had. That's a picture of us, just some of my closest friends. You know, people, uh, men that, that I have made priorities to keep in contact with for over 30 years. 
not once or twice even in a year, but four, five, six times, although every one of those three guys lives hundreds of miles away from us. There's rarely a month that goes by that I don't see one of them. Never a week that goes by that I don't talk to one of them. And that's just some of them. We've, we, we've stood up at each other's weddings. We've attended our children's weddings together. We, we have grieved divorces. We've, we've battled cancer together. We've attended our parents' funerals together. We've taken trips together. We've laughed and drank beer together. Laughs and beer go together a lot for us, it feels like, along with cigars. We've become really close, closer than even when we started, relying upon one another. And now our wives are friends too. And our children's concerns are all of our concerns, too. And their celebrations become our celebrations. This, this group is growing. So much so that when some of us gathered at Christmas just a few weeks ago, there was over 25 people there at that gathering. That just doesn't happen. You have to keep in contact. You have to make that a priority. You have to do that investment. So even these people that I like being with, <laughs> it's an investment to love them. It's work to love them. Good work, but work. Of course, we know that God sets the bar a little higher for us than just liking or loving the people that we like. God hopes that... that uh, that, that we love people that we don't know, strangers, people we don't have a lot in common with, people whose experiences aren't our experiences, who, whose way of living isn't like our way of living, whose culture isn't our culture. In fact, even people who are enemies, even people who we dislike, who we oppose, God smiles not only when we love family and friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, but when we love enemies even. This uh, picture of Martin Luther King crossing the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in March of 1965. And tomorrow's Martin Luther King Day, if you, if you hadn't realized that. And the Pettus Bridge, this bridge in Selma, Alabama, was named after a brigadier general in the Confederacy. Uh, a, a slave owner who risked his life in order to continue to enslave uh, people in the South, people in Alabama where he lived. And after the war, he became a senator, and, and he also organized the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. He was the head of it after he organized it, and the Ku Klux Klan was created after the Civil War in, in order to deny <laughs> those recently freed slaves from the rights that they were given in the Constitution shortly after the war. To deny them by violence and terror. That's whose name is on this bridge, the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. And this, during the civil rights movements of the 1960s, they passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Um, <clears throat> making a lot of the laws that many of our states had uh, no longer constitutional. To give. And then they were working on the Voting Rights Act. And so in 1965, they started doing these marches in Alabama between Montgomery and Selma. And when they marched in February over this Pettus Bridge in Selma, for voting rights, uh, the locals responded violently, meeting them on the bridge with horses and clubs and hoses and dogs. And many people were hurt, and it was called Bloody Sunday. And so Martin Luther King responded, Pastor Martin Luther King responded, by gathering more people, 
to cross that bridge just a few months later in March, or just a month later, rather, in March. And those more people were other brothers and sisters in Christ, pastors and, and Christians, black and white and brown from around the United States, came for that second march. And that's what this picture is. Is him responding with this violence peacefully. Him responding in this violence by gathering people in love. Him responding in violence with God's grace that he'd been given. This abundance that all of us are given that can change the world when we exercise that muscle together. And they crossed the bridge then and marched peacefully with the world watching the second time. And what I'm sure of, with all of Martin Luther King Jr.'s brokenness and sinfulness that any human that walks this earth has, that God smiled when he made it to heaven. For he was killed by one of those enemies just two years after this picture was taken. Assassinated for insisting on love. And that's why he's a national hero. And that's why we celebrate his day tomorrow. Because his love makes God smile. Just like our love makes God smile. There's so many things demanding our time and our attention in this world. Our priorities. And at the end of the day, if we can just keep in our mind what is going to bring a smile to God. It might start by bringing a smile to our neighbor. It might be something silly like getting a pie in the face to raise money for our youth. It might be something difficult like standing up when everyone's telling you to sit down. It might be something that you never knew you could do. Like singing in the midst of worship in front of people because of this gift of the Spirit you've received. <clears throat> but the game of life that God has given us from the waters of baptism flows right to our Maker, who really cares how you play that game. And who at the end of life, we hope, says, <laughs> well done, faithful servant. Amen. Yeah. 
with your love and all I have in you is more than enough. You're my sacrifice, the greatest prize. Still more. gather this worship in prayer and celebrate it. Yeah. Holy God, we give thanks for the gift of love that we have received, an abundance of love that comes our way in the waters of baptism. May we share this love graciously and joyfully with the world. And Lord, in the midst of lives, we receive blessings of talents and wealth. May we be just as generous with those Give us the wisdom, Lord, in our life to make the right investments that bring joy to heaven, that bring a smile on your holy face. We pray for all of our church leaders, pastors like Martin Luther King, that they be people of courage that stand up in the name of love. Pray for all of our state leaders that their hearts might be softened and they might lead and live their responsibility in a way that spreads love rather than hate. We pray for this congregation that love be made known here, that our lives bring joy to heaven that we embrace not just those that we like, but even those that irritate us, threaten us, might be called enemies. Lord, we're gonna be nourishment in the midst for this journey. So first we pray for your spirit to come to those who are weak or sick or troubled right now. We especially pray for those grieving. Mindy Mark Cart at the death of Tom, Pat at the death of Jack, and Bev at the Jack death of Mark. We pray for those who are sick or ill, all those suffering from COVID and, and teachers and hospital care workers and 
assisted living workers that are overwhelmed in this time. We pray for Kelly and Shelly and Mike, Kimberly, Meg, Susan, Jennifer, Ryan, Sherry, Adam, Karen, Judy, Bill, David, Steve, Tanya, Andrea, Fred, Lindy, Dolly, Jerry, Roberta, Dave, Kay, Naeem, Kelly, Phil, Alex, Sherry, Mary Lou, and others named now. And Lord, in order for us to bring the spirit of your love to those people in need, we trust that spirit finds us in this meal of bread and wine, as Jesus promised on the night he was betrayed. For he took bread and broke it and gave thanks and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we are proclaiming the mystery of faith that Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Transform us by your love. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. can share this meal with me at home or here in person. If you are at home and worshiping, you can come and pick up these cups, uh, these communion kits we call them, so you could uh, commune at home, or we could even deliver them to your house. You just need to call and let us know. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Lord, nourished by your body and blood, may we be strengthened to be your people now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll have just a few announcements before we scatter for today's work. If you didn't know, uh, our First Communion class started today. If you uh, didn't know that and you want to start next week, uh, if you're at home or maybe you have a fourth through sixth grader or someone that needs uh, communion uh, instruction, uh, you're, you're still not too late. Just uh, contact Adam, our family minister, and he'll, he'll get you in the, in the loop of that. But that started today during this worship service. The... Um, we're doing a quick gathering of juice uh, for Choices Domestic Abuse Shelter. I guess uh, the, the supply chain problems have made it so that 
Mid-Ohio Food uh, Bank does not have juice, and they go through six gallons a day, we're told, at the Choices Domestic Abuse Shelter here in Columbus. And uh, so they're asking their partner churches and their partner businesses to do some juice drives here in January to help them get through February for the supply chain to be figured out, I guess. So, <laughs> Debbie, you sounded like God calling there. I... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, huh. okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> I think you can do Kroger's if you're computer savvy. I think they do it on your little app, too. So there you go. Um, okay, so yeah, so that we're going to do that for the next two weeks. Um, I am, We do have a flower chart going on if you'd like to add flowers. Uh, Meg Reidler's family brought those flowers today in honor of their son's birthday. If you'd like to, to put flowers on the altar, you take them home with you uh, after the 11 o'clock worship, or you come back Monday and, and get them. They're, they're beautiful uh, normally, and they make, a nice, they make a nice gift for your house, and they're a great gift for us on Sunday morning. We used to have a, a paper flower chart, but that's old school. Now we're, now we're in this World Wide Web cloud thing. Uh, where if On your bulletin board, I think there's a link. To get, uh, to get to the flower ch chart, to put something on uh, for a date that's meaningful for you. If you don't want to uh, do the computer thing, you can call and bother Linda from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. She'd love to talk to you, and she'll find you the right date that you want, and, and you can organize that. So I do want to lift that up. I am uh, teaching on Erpberg's book. I don't know if teaching is even the right word. We're having discussions based on chapters in the book. Uh, we're not going to have uh, sermons based around it uh, uh, every Sunday for the next three weeks, but, but you, you might hear it again in another sermon or something. But if you really want to dig deeper into the book, at least with discussion, come. We're doing chapters 4 to 6 uh, this Wednesday at 6.30. You can do that at home or in person. It is easier to have a discussion in person. Uh, I think we had maybe more people at home than in person, and so hopefully it was Hopefully it was helpful that, that you could hear us talk, and, and, uh, and some, of you, uh, some of you were trying to be part of the conversation. I was trying to help make that happen. So, so uh, that's Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. in the evening. And then you heard, um, oh, and then there's a gathering for all the high school youth that are going to uh, Minnesota in the Fellowship Hall. I think it's at 1130 in your bulletin board, but it's probably in that bulletin board. And that's today, I'm pretty sure, is what that says. So um, is, Adam was back there, but he's gone now. I, I think that's what it says back there. Oh, what else did I have? Oh, I'm sorry. The last thing is, is, the, is disappointing news. Uh, Tom Marquardt died uh, over the weekend. And uh, Tom and Mindy were longtime members here, raised their two girls here in the church. Um, just had recently moved to Toledo. Uh, Tom and Mindy attended this uh, contemporary worship service. They had just uh, recently moved to Toledo to be near grandkids and things like that. And uh, he died suddenly at 71 of a massive stroke. And so, uh, so uh, Tom and Mindy are coming home, and we're going to have the uh, memorial service for, for Tom here in this space on uh, Saturday morning at uh, 11 o'clock, probably. Uh, so keep that in your prayers. And if you know Tom and Mindy, if you if you remember when they were active parts of our congregation, um, Tom uh, Tom was a part of the property committee when he served. Um, then uh, then it'd be it'd be great to be part of that celebration on Saturday morning. So we lift that up and lift Mindy and her daughters up in our prayers too. With all that, let's have our blessing before we leave. Look at you people. You knew to stand, huh? Look at that. You didn't even know they were standing behind you, did you, Lindora? <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you. God's peace. Amen. I
am not who I once was Defined by all the things I've done Afraid my shame would be exposed Afraid of really being known But then you gave my heart a home So I walked out of the darkness and into the light from fear of shame into the hope of life. Mercy called my name and made a way to fly out of the darkness and into the light. With years of keeping secrets safe, wondering When you're hiding all alone, your heart can turn into a stone. That's not the way I want to go. So I walked out of the darkness and into the light from fear of shame into the hope of life. Mercy called my name and made a way to. I'd rather be. Your light is marvelous. Your light is marvelous. You have come to set us free. You are marvelous. Your light is marvelous.